We've already seen how useful rates of change can be. Rate of change is um, just a slope when we analyze real-world data using linear regression. So part of what you did in your project was to explain what the slope means. Like, you know, if you had analyzed something like, um, you know, height and weight, maybe. And you came up with your slope is 3. That might indicate that would be a change in y over a change in x. Right. And change in y is 3. Change in x is 1. My units on y could be inches. Units on x would be pounds. So you would say that slope of 3 means a gain of 3 pounds per inch, something like that. So that's how we analyze slope. Three pounds per every additional inch. Okay. So we're going to look at um, models today that involve nonlinear data and continue our exploration of the role of rate of change. So for example, um, from physics, we know that the distance an object travels when in free fall is given by this formula. D of t yes. I was not answering the question. This was a no. I okay. Oh, you're right. Yeah, this should be no. Um. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> if that's height, weight. Then change in y over change in x, I'm sorry, is pounds over inches. So, okay, so I wrote it right when I did the sentence, but not in the fraction. <laughs> okay, so a function, um, this particular function gives the distance that an object has fallen if you drop it from some given height, right? So you can plug in time, it'll tell you how far it's fallen, just the distance it's fallen. So t in this formula represents time, and d of t represents distance that the object has fallen. So let's say we were going to drop an object from the top of a high building, like the Empire State Building. Okay. What window would you use to graph this function? So what would your, your t min be, or your x min? Smallest time that you would look at? Zero, Zero when you drop it, yep. And then look at, guesstimate, how long would it take to hit the ground? if you dropped it from 12,000, 1,250 feet. 12 seconds, okay. Okay, and then my y, remember, is d, d of t. That represents how far the object has fallen. So at time zero, how far has the object fallen? Zero, it hasn't fallen anywhere, right? And then what's the furthest it can fall? 1250, unless, you know, a hole opens up in the ground and it can continue falling through the earth. All right, so let's use our graphing calculator to graph this function. All right, so the function was 16t squared, using x because I don't have a t variable. And for my window, I'm going to use 0 to 12 and 0 to 1,250. Graph it. 
All right, so what does this graph reveal about the rate of change of distance with respect to time? Let me um, take a picture of this so we can draw on it. So what I mean by the rate of change with respect to time is how much the distance changes over constant units of time. So let's say over the first, from, from time t equals, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is time and this is distance. So if you look at how far the object travels between, say, second two and second three, so the distance on y that it travels is this teeny little distance here. Okay. But look at how far it travels between, say, second 8 and second 9. That distance right there. So over one second, early in the fall it travels a teeny little distance and over one second later in the fall it travels a big distance so my rate of change how far I fall per second is it constant no it's changing my rate of change is not constant in fact, it's getting bigger, right? My rate of change goes from a small amount in one second to a larger amount in one second. So we say the rate of change is increasing. And from physics, we should expect that, right? We know that when you drop an object, it actually accelerates. Gra there's an acceleration due to gravity that it falls faster and faster and faster. And that's why it's so dangerous to drop something off of a really high building, right? When you drop a penny off of a really high building, if it hits somebody, you can really hurt them because it's going very fast because it's been falling for a long time. Yeah. Um, actually, and if you dropped it from a plane, it might hit terminal velocity, but not from like 1,200 feet. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, but I don't think a penny would even hit terminal velocity from that from that height. But um, but if you drop from really high, there is a terminal velocity because eventually the force of gravity gets balanced by the air resistance. Um, once you start traveling at a certain speed, like you know, like if you ride a bike or drive a car with the windows down, like you feel more air hitting you the faster you go. So at some point, the force of gravity pulling on you is balanced by the force of the air pushing back because you're going so fast so that you end up going a, a constant speed. But that doesn't happen until you've been falling for a while. All right, so what common term do we use to describe change in distance with respect to time? Speed. Or velocity. Okay, in daily language, those two words mean the same thing. Um, in physics, velocity means the same thing as speed, except it has a direction. So velocity tells you speed and direction. Speed just tells you speed. All right, so here's um, a couple of screenshots from the calculator. Same function. This is y equals 16x squared that I graphed. So given this table of values, what is d of 3? Plus 
144. Yep, we just look to the table. D of 3 is 144. And what does that mean? What does that equation mean? D of 3 equals 144. Yep, and what do x and y represent here? Time and distance. So after three seconds, the object has fallen 144 feet. Yep. All right, and what is d of 1? 16. So that says after one second, the object has fallen 16 feet. So how far did it fall in between time t equals 1 and t equals 3? 128. Subtract the two distances. So we do 144 minus 16 feet, and that's 128 feet. So from time t equals 1, if I could like freeze time and note where the object is at t equals 1, and then freeze time again at t equals 3, subtract the two distances, and I get how far it fell in those two seconds. So in general, Speed, remember, from our word problems, is um, change in distance divided by change in time. Distance divided by time. Change in distance divided by change in time. And what is my change in distance from t equals 1 to t equals 3? 128 feet. And my change in time from t equals 1 to t equals 3? 2 seconds. So that gives me an average speed over those two seconds of 64 feet per second. It doesn't mean that that's how fast I was traveling the whole time. That's just my average speed. Because I know for a fact that at t equals 3 seconds, I'm traveling faster than I was at t equals 1 second. But on average, over those two seconds, average speed is 64 feet per second. All right, using the same approach, calculate the average speed from t equals 3 to t equals 4 and a half. Okay, so what's my net change in distance? So that would be um, my distance at 4 and a half seconds minus my distance at 3 seconds. Right, subtract the two distances, and what are those numbers? Is that what everybody else has? Okay, and that comes out to 180 feet. So this is called um, net change. Your textbook refers to the change in distance, or whatever the y is, the change in y, they call that net change. And then, when you take the net change and divide by the change in time or the change in x, this is the average rate of change. Average rate of change. 180 feet divided by, what's my change in time? 1.5 seconds. From 3 to 4.5 is 1.5 seconds. And 180 divided by 1.5. 120 feet per second. Okay. And it makes sense that 120 should, should have come out bigger than the 64, right? Because the longer we're falling, the faster my speed is. So 1 to 3 has a slower average speed than 3 to 4.5. All right, in general, you calculate average speed or average rate of change of distance with respect to time as time changes from t equals a to t equals b by calculating distance at b minus distance at a. That gives you your net change in distance. Actually, I'm going to write change in d over change in t, change in distance over change in time. And you calculate change in distance by doing your distance at time b minus your distance at time a. And you calculate your change in time by doing b minus a. So d of b and d of a 
those are y coordinates, right? So this is like change in y. This is like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is the formula for what? Slope. This is a slope that I have calculated. It's the slope from, for this first example, 1 to 3. I calculated the slope of the straight line that connects those points. So the function is not a straight line, it's a curve, but when you calculate the average rate of change, you are actually finding the slope of the straight line that connects the two points. So there's really no new kind of calculation here. It's just same old slope. It's just that the line um, isn't drawn there. You have to say, okay, I want the average rate of change from t equals 1 to t equals 3, draw the line, the slope of that line is your average rate of change. So in general, we don't always calculate rates of change just for functions that measure distance and time. Um, we can do them for all kinds of functions. And in general, we, we define average rate of change as change in y over change in x, or f of b minus f of a over b minus a. All right, so we have two frogs, Frida and David. Um, they're running a race. And these graphs give their distance that they've run as a function of time. So distance in miles, time in hours. I want you to discuss in your groups um, these questions about Frida and David. All right. How many hours was this race? Five hours. And who won? They tied because, how do you know that? They both went exactly five miles in five hours. So this last point for both of them is at five comma five. Five hours, five miles. So this is a tie. Both traveled five miles in five hours. Does travel have two L's? I don't think so. Okay. So the average speed for each frog over the entire race, one MPH. If they went five miles, change in distance. So for both frogs, their average rate of change is going to be five miles over five hours is one mile per hour. They both average one mile per hour. But they couldn't have both traveled, their, but their graphs look different, right? So they, they didn't both travel at a constant one mile per hour. It fluctuated. So let's look at the average speed over the first two hours for each frog. So for Frida, she starts at zero, zero, and goes to two, two, right? So Frida's change in distance over change in time. Change in distance is two miles. Change in time is two hours. So Frida is going one mile per hour for the first two hours. But David, we need his change in distance and change in time. So David, we go to two hours, go up to the graph, and we see David actually traveled about two and a half miles in the first two hours. So David's change in distance is 2.5 miles. Change in time is two hours. So this is 1.25 miles per hour. So David, over the first two hours, was running faster, on average, than Frida. Okay. So what's each frog's strategy? Yeah, so Frida is constant speed, slow and steady. Okay, and then David, did he, when you say rest, do you mean he slowed down or he actually rested and stopped? 
Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. From hour two to hour three, it looks like he didn't travel any distance at all. The Y doesn't change. So he actually did run fast. Then he just, like, stopped and we sat down, had a snack or something. And then he ran fast to the end. So David went fast, rest, and then ran fast to catch up. Okay, so that finishes up average rate of change. Anybody have questions? All right, so I want to um, do a new example with piecewise. So you're just going to have to write it down, okay, because I don't have it in the notes. Does anybody have a data plan for their cell phone? Do you happen to know um, like what your plan is, like how much, how and it's what happens if you go over four gigabytes? You don't know. Okay. What? Okay. So forty dollars for two gigabytes, and then. Every gigabyte over is $15. Each additional gigabyte is $15. Or, or would it be 90% of 15? Do you know? They probably charge you for partial for a partial gigabyte. You don't think so? You think they'd round it up? And they're going to charge you for a second? Okay. Okay, so um, let's... The easier model is if they charge you for partial. So let's do that first, and then we'll try to modify it to, to do what they actually... what actually happens. So for A, we're going to assume that you're charged for partial gigabytes, okay? And then B, we're going to assume that you round up to the next gigabyte, right? So if you use 0.2 gigabytes, they're actually going to charge you for a whole another gigabyte. All right, so I want to write a formula that represents this system, how, how we charge for, for this data plan. Close. So let's see. So let's see. My cost is a function of x, and x will be um, the number of gigabytes you use. So I have a big curly bracket. And sometimes you just pay $40, right? Some, most of the time, if you chose wisely, your bill comes and it's $40 because you didn't go over two gigabytes. Right? So this happens if x is less than or equal to 2. And actually, maybe I should say between 0 and 2. Because you can't use negative gigabytes. And um, even if you use nothing, they're going to charge you $40 right? because you signed up for it. All right, so now if I go over 2, x is bigger than 2, you suggested 40 plus 15x. Okay. So let's see what happens. If I used, say, 3 gigabytes, according to this formula, I would have to pay 40 plus 15 times 3, which is too much, right? Why is that too much? Why is that wrong? Yeah. The first two gigs are included in this $40, and you only have to pay $15 for the third one. So how can I, how do I put an expression here that means the amount I used over two? Okay. 
Okay, I can do x minus 2 in parentheses. 15 times x minus 2. So if x is your usage, subtract 2 from it, because you already paid for that with your $40, and you get charged 15 for each one over that. Okay, so that is a good formula for my general usage. Let's draw a picture of it. We'll graph it. Um, so here's zero, and this is X, number of gigabytes I use, and this is C for cost. I'll do like by tens. Okay, and then this will just go by ones for gigabytes. Okay, so for the first piece of my graph, the um, $40, what does the line y equals 40 look like? H horizontal line. And I'm going to graph that horizontal line only for x's between 0 and 2, okay. including the 0 and the 2. So at 40, up until 2, I have a horizontal line at 40. That's how much I pay for any amount between 0 and 2. And then if I go over 2, I have a whole different line, right? So maybe I could, if I'm not sure what it looks like, I could either put it in my graphing calculator or I could make a little xy chart, right? And this is for the line y equals 40 plus 15 times x minus 2. So just pick a couple points. Like, I think I might try 2, 3, and 4, something like that. I'm, I'm, I, wanna, I know that I'm only going to graph this line for x is bigger than 2, so that's why I didn't put in 0 or 1. And then I want to see how it compares to 2. Because um, I know that if it's 2, I pay $40. And... If I put a 2 in here, I still get $40, because I get the 2 minus 2, which is 0. So whichever formula you use, whether it's the $40 flat one, or the $40 plus 15 times x minus 2, you get $40 either way. Yeah. Right. Right. So if I plug a 3 in here, I get 40 plus 15, which is 55. And if I put a 4 in there, I get 40 plus 30, which is 70. So I have 3 comma 55, about right there, and 4 comma 70, which is about right there. And this is my line for what I pay after the first two gigabytes. So this circle is colored in because I colored it in with the horizontal line. And this line comes right down to it, right? So it ends up getting colored in. That make sense? All right, so let's go back to the formula and talk about this, the small complication, right, this part B. Assume that we round up for the next gigabyte. We always round up to the next gigabyte. So this part wouldn't change. The $40 is still $40 for any amount from 0 to 2. Now, what would happen if I had to round this x minus 2 up? So if I used, say, 2.2 gigabytes. I would get charged for a whole extra gigabyte. So what do I have to do to the x minus 2 to make that the appropriate input? So you want to round up? <clears throat> 
So remember last class we talked about the greatest integer function that rounds down? So there's a similar function that rounds up, and the symbol for greatest integer was this. The round down had like the little feet, and you call it, it's sometimes called the floor function. The round up function is sometimes called ceiling, and you just flip it over. So if I want to indicate round up, I would do this x minus 2, and then after I do the subtraction, I would just round up. And I would say, just round that number up. So this guy was floor. This guy is ceiling. So that will round up. So now if I put in 2.2, .2, I would do 2.2 .2 minus 2 and get 0.2. And then the ceiling bars says round that up to a whole 1. And then what would my graph look like? The 40 wouldn't change. What would this look like if I did that and rounded everything up to the nearest whole one? It would look like stairs, yeah. And it would be like over 2 to 3. If you used any amount between 2 to 3, you'd get charged the same amount as you get charged for 3. So it would be like that. And if you use any amount between 3 and 4, you would get charged the amount you get charged for 4. You get charged for 4. So this would be like, oh, that probably should be, hold on. So you would have a stair function climbing up like this. 5. That makes sense. So that's sort of um, uh, a place where piecewise functions occurs that, that I happened to think of. Right, happens in real life data plans. Um, I, ha I gave you four of them as an activity. Um, can you guys think of any other places where piecewise functions come up in real life? Right. So yeah, so that's a that's a like a greatest integer function, yeah. yeah. So you would have a step there. Library overdue books, good. Anything else? Oh yeah, okay. So if you get charged by weight for food and they only charge for integer values, yeah. That would be piecewise. Is that a thing? I've never heard of that. Okay. Okay. Oh. So you only so you only enter a dollar amount. Yes. Oh. Hmm. So it wouldn't always be rounded down or up. Interesting. Um. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it would just be a, it would be more complicated to to write as a piecewise, but you could do it. You would have to, the if statement would just be more complicated. Come on, there's like a million. Think about it in your groups. Discuss in your
letter grade as a function of percentage, right? This would be, this actually has several pieces, right? You can get, an, your outputs are now letters instead of numbers, but it's still a function. We talked about how functions don't have to have numbers as the inputs and outputs. So your, your letter grade could be A, and just to simplify things, so I don't have to write a million things. Your letter grades are A, B, C, D, and F, five different outputs. You get an A if your percentage is between 90 and 100, and including both. Okay. And you get a B if your percentage is between 80 and 90 right up to 90 but not including and you get a C if your percentage is between 70 and 80 right so you get you get the idea D is 60 to 70 and then you get an F if your percentage is below 60. That's a good one. I like it. And then the other one I heard was the internet provider, right? So your cost for internet. It's like sometimes they call they give you these special deals that you it's like super cheap for a year and then the cost goes up, right? So your cost as a function of time right, would be you get a certain price, like they, something ridiculously low, like $19.99 per month if time is between 0 and 12 months, right, and then after that it goes to like $59.99 or some ridiculously higher amount after 12 months. Anybody come up with another one? Yes, that's true. Actually, we did that one in our last lecture. Um, no, that's okay. Where is it? Yeah, your late pay your late payment fee. Oh, okay. So actually, what you just said is something different. So. Your, your minimum balance is either, oh yeah, good one, that's a good one, okay. So what you have to pay is like $10 or a certain percentage of what you owe, right? Whichever one's higher. That's a good one. So your minimum payment on a credit card is a function of the balance you're carrying on your credit card. So your payment is a function of their balance. And it's usually 10 or $20, right? Something, some minimal amount. If your balance is below something and it's actually, it varies from credit card to credit card. Like mine used to be 1% and then I transferred it to a credit union and now it's like 3%, right? but so it varies. So let's just say 1% you know, of your balance is due each month if your balance is over a certain amount. So what, what balance, what, what's the cutoff point? Like your, your, Statement will say you either get charged 1% of your balance or $10, whichever is more. A thousand, how'd you get that? Yeah, yeah, so you have to go, okay, well, what 1% um, of what would be $10? Because that's where they're equal, right? And then you divide both sides by 0.01 and you get X would have to be $1,000. So at $1,000, the one percentage and the $10 are the same. So then it wouldn't matter which one they charge you. Oops. 
So if B is less than or equal to 1,000, your minimum payment is 10 bucks. And if it's over 1,000, you have to pay 1% of what you owe. These are great examples. Um, okay, so for the last 20 minutes, um, you can, or I would like you to, not you can, um, take the three examples that we just came up with and graph them. Okay. And if you have, if and if you haven't finished, finish the problems from this exploration.